It's never easy to give someone bad news, so I'm just going to come right out and say it. Eric Hoven teamed up with Answers in Genesis and made a parody of the 2006 film Night at the Museum titled Night at the Creation Museum. And we're going to cover it. You might be thinking, wow, pretty cringe that they went with a 2006 movie. Isn't that like 15 years out of date? Couldn't they have picked a more recent film to create a parody on? You know, one that like the youth of today were actually alive to see? And to that, I say, no, this is actually just very in character. You have to remember, young earth creationists are consistently pulling from literature that is 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years old in rare cases. So why would we expect them to utilize a sense of humor that is rooted in something a bit more this decade? I'm not saying that Night at the Museum with Ben Stiller isn't a fun film. I liked that movie. I'm sure some of it holds up, but I know that some of it doesn't. And more importantly, what a weird movie to pick when you're trying to get the attention of little kids. When Night at the Museum came out, it was for like 10 to 14 year olds, I would say, maybe a little bit younger. Um, and 10 to 14 year olds today were not born in 2006. So these references are probably completely lost on them. And trust me, there are references. Museum come alive at night or something around here. And if you thought that it was realistic for young earth creationists to put out something funny and relevant, then you are a fool for having those expectations and you should have known better. <laughs> This is more of a labor of spite than anything else. This showed up on my Twitter timeline, and since I had to see it, you have to see it too. And we're going to have to suffer through it as a team. Just like Warden Shears and Joyce in Bridge Over the River Kwai, classic from 1957. Oh, was that reference not funny and dated? Fuck you. We're doing this the Eric Hovind way. Welcome to the Creation Today show. My name is Eric Hovind. I am the president of Creation Today, and we wanted to do something a little extra special for you and your family this Christmas. Why does that feel like a threat? <laughs> so I took a trip up to the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter, and I filmed something that I think you're gonna kind of like, okay? Now, not scientifically possible! Please don't be too hard on it. Uh, I filmed it on my cell phone and it's not even an iPhone. I know, I know some of you guys are probably judging me already. What? I record with a webcam and I edit in an open source software. So I'm not going to judge any production quality very hard. However, I will judge what is said. I hope that you guys get a kick out of this fun little video that we did. I imagine we will get a kick out of it and that it'll feel like getting kicked in the kidneys. I apologize for being quippy and cynical, but I've covered a lot of Eric Covent and I've covered a lot of answers in Genesis and I feel very non-optimistic, very pessimistic about the content that we are about to consume. We really did just want people to have the truth. That's our goal. We want people to have the truth. 
and to know and love their creator, God. Our goal as a ministry is to keep changing lives one at a time till we reach the whole world. Wait a damn minute. <laughs> What a damn. Here's your annual disclaimer that I don't really have a problem with science affirming theism. It's mostly just young earth creationism that we like to dunk on here on this channel. Roll it. The intro's actually pretty good. <laughs> they really nail like the Night at the Museum music and the font. I don't know where they got the font. I guess they like recreated it. There is one spot when they're doing the credits where you can see that it says a film by Eric Hovind, which, or an Eric Hovind film, something like that, which is kind of funny. And then there's another one where you see like a, a crumbling block castle and it's being held up by a Sagan, Darwin, and <laughs> Dawkins book compared to like this better block castle that's held up just on the Bible. It's like some classic, it's very subliminal. We, we like to see the high effort stuff. So Eric Hoven's character drives up to start his new security job and he's worked previous security jobs, but he's driving like a brand new Camaro, which uh, points off for realism there, guys. Hey Sarah, did Ricky make it in okay? Oh good, yeah, I hate to run off like that, but I got a job at a new place, it's some kind of I don't know, museum or something. Museum is generous. So Eric Hoven's character like talks on the phone for a minute with who we only can assume must be his wife or husband, wink. Um, and then we see the entrance of Tim Shaffey's character. Yeah, I could do that. Okay. Oh, I gotta go. I'll see you at 7.30. All right, bye. Hey, are you Derek? Yeah, Derek Daly, new night guard around here. Hey, good to meet you, I'm Jim. Pleasure to meet you, Jim. You know, you're five minutes late. Oh, yeah, I know, I, uh, I'm i kidding. You're, you're on time, I'm busting your chaps a little oh. bit. Oh, man. <laughs> right. So if you wanted to play a super lethal drinking game with night at the Creation Museum, you would take a drink every time there is a joke that does not land. Or generally jokes that make you uncomfortable. Finishing your drink should be reserved for those jokes that make you want to leave this mortal coil. Did you bring your shield? I didn't know I needed one. The uh, museum come alive at night or something around here? You never know. No, actually, you, you remind me of Captain America. You remind me of Captain America. You remind me of Captain America. Are you joking? What? Show me. Show me. You need oh, wait, to show me. Finish your drink right now. <laughs> I was expecting more Ben Stiller. Ben's oh, I got it. I guess uh, guess I should have been expecting uh, Dick Van Dyke then, huh? <laughs> that's good, that's good. <laughs> Is it because they're just talking about th the actors who played the characters in Night at the Museum? <laughs> Jim and Derek walk to the front desk and Jim asks Derek some prying questions. Oh yeah, divorced? Well separated. It's kind of oh. complicated. Okay. Sorry to hear that. How old is he? Jim, Tim Shaffey's character, feels like a introverted salamander were cast into the role. He's just very stilted in comparison to Eric's much bubblier persona. They make their way to the front desk and Jim starts to tell our main character how this is gonna work. Do everything on the list, in order. All right. And pay attention, don't fall asleep. Oh, don't worry about that. I've done security for years. There's a reason it's both, don't fall asleep. Yeah, man, I won't, I'm good. Okay. Well, you know, the last guy fell asleep, and he was never the same. What happened? Have you been to the museum? Falling asleep is going to turn Eric Hoven's character into a creationist, isn't it? Eric Hoven's character bids Tim Shaffey adieu and makes a crack about how Tim Shaffey is a very large man, which that is true. I'm not sure if Eric Hovind is short and Tim Shaffey is tall, and that's why Tim feels especially large, but 
Then Eric Coven starts to kind of like screw around and, you know, act like a kind of befuddled security guard. He's doing the Ben Stiller thing. That's that's what he's doing from Night at the Museum. Uh, have a good night. Don't step on any kids. <laughs> this goes so far as to the point where in like a prank, his character calls Tim Shaffey Gigantor over the loudspeaker, which is, I guess, the thing that Owen Wilson's character called Ben Stiller in Night at the Museum. That's most of the jokes in this entire film, right, is, is references to a movie that the kids watching were not alive to see. Did you guys meet Gigantor? Just introduced me to my new job. You blow a hole in your mountain, all you're gonna hit is a wall. Step aside, Gigantor, we got us a railroad to build. We're blowing a hole in that thing. Case in point, immediately afterwards, he goes to the exhibit that houses a very inaccurate representation of Lucy Australopithecus afarensis, and he calls it Dexter, which is the name of the capuchin monkey from Night at the Museum. Dexter. Ooh. <laughs> oh. Remember you? What was your name? Dewey? Dewey? De 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 Deborah? Dex? Dexie? Dexter? <gasps> Dexter? I want you to know something, pal. You're not fooling anybody. Nobody. They got you in your own little prison cell now, don't they? There's also a joke where he sees the Adam and Eve replicas and thinks that they're like getting up to no good. It's very ambiguous. I'm not sure if it's meant to be a sex joke or not, honestly. Two naked people. What kind of a museum is this anyway? Then Eric does this gag where he's like pretending to be the mean evolutionist, atheist, something or other, where he d does a joke. He does like two jokes. They're, they're not funny, but here you go. Naturalistic evolution and biblical creation. Ha! <laughs> they don't even believe in science. Adam and Eve. I wonder if they think those Bible stories are true. Eric does some more screwing around and then he falls asleep. And there are a bunch of like weird aerial shots of him and his face sleeping. Then he is awoken from his slumber with a loud sound, and he gets ready to go check it out. Hello? At this point, you're thinking, yes, this is where the silly nonsense where there's like, the, the attractions are coming alive, and probably most of the budget for this little project of Eric's went to, and we're gonna get to see some like, fun, down-to-earth practical effect, and it may be in the Creation Museum, but at least it'll be entertaining. Right? I mean, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> this is actually one of the more fun parts of the, of the video, of the movie, right? Anyways, eventually Eric finds himself in the Hall of Sorrows, which if you've watched my Ark Encounter video, and you should, it should be the prereq to this video because we actually get the full layout of what the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter kind of looked like. He ends up in the Hall of Sorrows and this happens. This is not how it was meant to be. <gasps> Jim! What, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? I'm guarding the museum. No, you're not. You're sleeping. I'm not sleeping. I was napping. Mm, that joke wasn't that bad. Tim Shaffey's character prompts Eric Coven's character to talk about how his mom had cancer, and Eric Coven's character muses that there's so much evil in the world than there has been for millions of years, so how can you have a museum that supports Bible stories being true. And Tim Shaffey responds with, Oh, you mean evolution? Yeah. Let's see about that. Whoa! 
Remember guys, anything that disagrees with young Earth creationism falls into the umbrella category of evolution or evolutionism. So Tim Shafi has like Thanos snapped Eric Hoven's character into my favorite room in the Creation Museum, which is the most wrong room in the Creation Museum and the one that discusses human evolution. What happened? What'd you do? Oh, Dexy. No, not Dexy. Lucy. Lucy. Australopithecus afarensis. You know, missing link, one of our ancestors, right? I learned about her in school. Yeah. yeah only problem is, not a missing link. No? And not one of our ancestors. Really? Oh boy, I sure hope we get to beat the dead horse that is Australopithecine species diversity and how we know that they're bipedal and the numerous different specimens that go into how we know what these critters probably look like. I wonder if we'll cover the white sclera as we always do. Australopithecus, southern ape. She's an ape, yet when they depict her in museums and zoos around the world, oftentimes they put human feet on Lucy. Take a look at the skeleton behind Lucy. How many foot bones do you see with her? She doesn't have any. That's right, none. And yet they put human feet. Why? Because that is their, that's their bias. So how many times are we going to have to go through this one on the channel, right? Lucy, the specimen, is not the only specimen of Australopithecus that we have. We have dozens of specimens that are a member of her species, Australopithecus afarensis, but we have remains from over 300 individuals who are a part of the Australopithecus genus. And many of those include postcranial remains, that cover the feet, like the famous Dakika child. And it's from these specimens that we know Lucy's genus had feet that were indeed quite like those of humans, of anatomically modern Homo sapiens and indeed every hominin that spans between us. This morphology that necessitates bipedality includes an inline big toe or halix, as well as three arches in the feet. Australopithecus had those just like we do. But in addition to this, Australopithecus also had our bowl-shaped pelvis to strengthen the pelvic floor and anchor powerful gluteal muscles, an anterior foramen magnum, or hole at the base of the skull, so that Lucy could hold her head upright, her species could hold her head upright on the vertebral column. And of course, this also includes the valgus knee, which allows the weight to be held directly underneath the body, just like a biped. Lucy's specimen has most of these, but the genus has all of them, and they're well represented across dozens of different individual finds. Also, Tim Shafi, you, you are an ape as well, right? You have these mobile shoulder blades in the back that are oriented dorsally. You have a larger brain for your body size, a long gestation, highly mobile wrists. You have a Y5 pattern on your molars, a 2123 dental formula, all sorts of different traits that necessitate you as an ape. And since that time, we have found more specimens of Australopithecus and we found foot bones and their feet are very ape-like. I really don't know how he feels he can get away with saying this since we can just put pictures up and talk about how the morphology of the feet assigned to Australopithecus the genus necessitate bipedality as well as the other traits that necessitate bipedality. But then again, they don't show the foot specimens there at the Creation Museum, do they? Because if they showed them, instead of just musing about them abstractly, people might see that they do have these bipedal adaptations. Just like their skull. The large one there in the middle is Australopithecus. That's the same species as Lucy. And you see the other ones around there, the gorilla, the orangutan. I've said it before and I'll say it again. If you can't properly pronounce orangutan and you call it orangutan, then you have no business talking about human evolution. You just have, it's like the basics, right? Very much the same. Lucy was an ape. And the best evidence for Lucy being a missing link is found in the artwork. Notice how they don't actually go into the morphologic criteria that assigns and designates these skulls as being 
ape skulls because the same criteria that designates them as apes or hominoids slash hominids, depending on if we're going the superfamily or family, would land humans in that category, which is why the Creation Museum, as I've discussed at length in my Ark Encounter and Creation Museum video, has to talk very vaguely, very abstractly about these concepts of what constitutes an ape and what constitutes a human. Form. And you can do whatever you want with it. If you want it to look more like an orangutan, you put the orangish brown hair on it. If you want it to look like a gorilla, dark hair, dark eyes. And if you want it to show intelligence, almost like it's becoming human, you put whites in the eyes there, which no ape has, only humans have that. I mean, shit, dude. <laughs> you could just Google this. White sclera, as I've mentioned dozens of times perhaps on this channel, are found in all of the hominids. We see them in gorillas, we see them in orangutans, we see them in chimps, we see them in bonobos, and of course we see them in humans. The reason that they are selected for when they show up naturally in, in the variation of the species is because they help allow us to gaze follow. It's helpful within a social group to be able to see where your conspecifics are looking with their eyeballs. I, this is just such an easy one and one that is so frustrating because Tim Shaffy couldn't be bothered, just like none of them can ever be bothered, to double check the things that they hear from each other. But how much of those things are preserved, the hair and the eyes, how much of that is in the fossils? Well, none of it. None of it. So it's showing the artwork, it's showing their worldview. But I don't know, man. Why would so many scientists believe in evolution? It's, it's probably got to be true. You know what, let's go see what evolution leads to. What evolution leads to? I'm sure this is going to be very measured. A human? Caged as a zoo primate? <laughs> like, caged as a zoo primate? <laughs> what, what is that specification? <laughs> It should be noted that there is a darker side to most sciences, and unfortunately, since anthropology and biological anthropology deal with human evolution, it covered a lot of portions of history where people were incredibly racist and needed a motivation to be racist. So they did it using things like social Darwinism and trying to warp human evolution into saying that some races are less evolved than others. A lot of things, though, were used by racist people to justify mistreatment of who they thought to be lesser than them, including religion. It should also be noted that in that section of the Creation Museum, Origin of Species is being kept in the same cases like Mein Kampf, which is funny because creationists will often say that Hitler was like this big Darwinist and that it was Darwinism, this idea of natural selection and evolution, that spurred some of his genocidal tendencies. But like, Origin of Species was on the list of books to be burned, as commanded by Hitler, right? Like, he was a religious person. They put him in a cage in a zoo just because they thought he was part monkey? They did. Well, sometimes people take things too far. After this section, we get <laughs> Thanos snapped into the planetarium where we get to see Eric Covind interact with one of the head honchos of the astronomy division of Answers in Genesis. But it doesn't change science. I mean, we know the Earth is billions of years old. I mean, how else would we see starlight that's billions of light years away? You want to see stars? Yeah, the night sky is pretty wild. Who said that? I did. Who's, who's I? Me. <laughs> who's me? <laughs> I have the answers you're looking for. <sighs> Young oh. man, come down from there. I actually kind of like the gag they pull here where Eric is seemingly floating through this expanse of time in a disembodied head of Danny Faulkner <laughs> summons him back to the ground and it turns out Eric is just like standing on a desk being a dingus. What's going on here? Yeah, you know, you're right. A lot of people have questions about distant starlight and time. I was just thinking that. Yeah, you're probably wondering how, if the universe is only thousands of years old, how light from billions of light years could have gotten here. Exactly, isn't that a big problem? Yes. Well, not really. 
No? No, you have to understand, first of all, that the light year is not a unit of time, it's a unit of distance. So that's how far away they are. That's correct. My dude, <laughs> D equals RT. It's just as problematic if it's a measure of distance. Now we, how do we see it? How do we see it? Well, there's different possibilities. Some people have suggested the speed of light has not always been what it is today. Some people suggested relativistic uh, sort of solutions dealing with general relativity. On the other hand, maybe God performed a miracle during the creation week to rapidly bring the light here. It's good to know that there still isn't a solution to their speed of light issue, just like there isn't an issue to the heat problem. But <laughs> I, I can't believe they wasted a segment of the film by having him talk to Danny Faulkner about a very real issue. Now we're back to another miracle. Yeah, you know, the Big Bang model also has a miracle too. What? Yeah, there's a thing called the horizon problem. Early in the universe, getting light to travel across and bring the temperature of the universe to one single temperature. I've and, never heard of that. Yeah, you probably haven't, but they've tried to solve that with what we call cosmic inflation. Though there's no evidence for it and nobody knows how it works but people believe it anyway. No evidence for cosmic inflation, eh? So you're telling me the Big Bang has a miracle, but it doesn't have a miracle maker. And creation has a miracle with a miracle maker. God, dude, it's so weak. Their solution to the issue that the speed of light presents is to just say, yeah, but what about the Big Bang, right? And then they present a decades old issue that it has indeed been solved and has a large body of literature behind it, and then have Eric Hovind finish by being like, well, now that you mention it, I guess the Big Bang is actually the inferior model, which is one part hysterical, but also kind of embarrassing. That's about it. Huh. Yes, and you know, when you really think about it, the problem is not the light travel time problem. The problem is creation itself. You know, the universe is pretty vast, and it takes a very big God, a very powerful God to make something like this. So the real question is creation. If you believe that God created the universe, I think you would agree that the light travel time problem is small potatoes by comparison. I guess you got a point there. So... We saw this coming though. The same thing is going to happen with the heat problem and any other physics-defying issue that is presented to young Earth creationism. They'll simply say, fine, we admit that we require a miracle, but what about insert unanswered question in science? You need a miracle here. It's just, it's an accusatory god of the gaps to me. Congratulations to Knight at the Creation Museum for presenting us with the most convoluted, roundabout way of saying God did it that I've ever heard in my life. You guys really do have answers. Yes, we do. Answers. In Genesis, am I right, folks? I don't know that there's actually a way for me to prepare you for what you're about to see next. There is an element of foot fetishization, perhaps, although maybe that's me reading into it. But moreover than that, it's a Kafka-esque, horrifying liminal experience that really can only be consumed on its own. You're not wearing any shoes. No, nah, I don't like shoes. <laughs> Meet Teddy. <gasps> Teddy? Wake up, Derek. Why are we slapping each other? Derek, wake up. Wake up, Derek. Ah! It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. Goodbye, everyone. I'll remember you all in therapy. After Eric Hovind is done fleeing the physical manifestation of his existential dread in the form of a teddy bear that Danny Faulkner carries around, we do finally get to see him get chased by some dinosaurs, kind of. Really, it's a bunch of 
strategic shooting with the phone camera. This is the part where I am going to kind of come for the phone camera a little bit. I feel like they could have been a lot more creative with how they did this dinosaur chase sequence. Mostly it's Eric Hoven like looking up and seeing you know, like a, a plaster model of a dinosaur and then getting scared. It's not so much what we see in Night at the Museum where it's like a like a cool T-Rex skeleton that actually does come to life and it chases Ben Stiller, hijinks and Sue, you know, that kind of thing. Fortunately, something much scarier does happen after the chase sequence. He runs into Tim Shaffey again. Oh, don't eat me. Don't eat me. Derek, <laughs> you don't have to be afraid of these guys. They're all dead. Whoa! Ah! Meet Ebenezer. Ebenezer? Our Allosaur. You know, a lot of people have been taught the dinosaurs lived 65 million years ago. The truth is, they were created on day six, the same day that God made Adam and Eve. No way, man. You're telling me that this guy lived with people? He's a fossil. I mean, fossils were buried, you know, in rock layers that are, you know, millions of years old. <laughs> Next, there's a gag where Eric Hoven's character fails to explain how fossilization happens. There's this general idea, it seems, with Answers in Genesis, with creations generally, where they don't seem to understand how fossilization actually happens and what the material that we have today actually is. The dinosaur bones that we have just hit my laptop. The dinosaur bones that we have are mineralized bone. It's not the actual original bones themselves. You sure would think that if, if it happened 6,000 years ago that we would have the bones themselves, but I digress. Now fossils can form in many different ways. Some of the fossil remains that we have are the results of organisms falling into things like eutrophic lakes. They sink to the bottom and anoxic conditions help preserve their bodies. Sometimes it's tar or peat bogs that they fall into. Sometimes they're preserved in amber. Sometimes it's landslides. What Tim Shaffey is correct on is that organisms do have to be quickly covered by something so that they don't end up being taken apart by scavengers. Their bones strewn all across, all over the place, right? All across the continent. But what he's incorrect on is that the conditions that all the fossils that we have today are identical. In fact, they are very unique. Very frequently, we'll have dinosaurs that were buried in things like seasonal flooding events. So they do get covered partially, but the tops of the bones have you know, signs of scavengers coming and nibbling at what's been exposed. So that's going to be something that's a little bit difficult to do under flood conditions if a giant water, you know, wave came and instantly covered everything globally, or at least over the course of a year did so. But they make it out of this section effectively by strawmanning taphonomy as a field. They, uh, With lots of dead things. Of course, yep, so all around the world. That means that there was a worldwide flood, just like described in the book of Genesis, which is found in the Bible, the history book of the universe. History book of the universe? We're going to skip the historicity of the Bible section, mostly because it has nothing to do with evolution or the age of the earth. Being able to corroborate historical events that were written down in the Bible is not a threat to general science, right? I'm cool with it, and I really don't think that any conventional scientist wouldn't be. Although it is curious that the more fantastic elements of these stories aren't preserved in the archaeologic record. Nor are these fantastic elements corroborated by other cultures who were around at the time. It's just an interesting thing to note. So Eric Hoven's character tries to wake himself up and the ghost of Tim Shaffey tells him, You can't. Why not? Not until you decide. Decide what? That you're going to take all of this seriously. This would actually be a reasonable circle of hell to place me in when I die, right? Like you have the opportunity to either believe the Creation Museum's warped, misrepresentative, and generally ignorant science, quote unquote, or stay trapped in the Creation Museum for the rest of eternity. I think I would just have to wander around the halls, a, a ghoulish apparition living in the Creation Museum until the heat death of the universe, because I simply could not in good conscience 
awake from the dream like Eric Hoven's character and, and proselytize that. The horror, the existential dread of it all. After being guilt-tripped by the phantom that is Tim Shafee's dream avatar about the death of his wife, Eric Hoven's character basically says, okay, I guess I'll think about it, and then he's like astrally projected back into his body. After waking up, the real Tim Shafee, the corporeal Tim Shafee, comes back and guides Eric Hovind to the gift shop in classic Answers in Genesis fashion. There, we get a shilling for a different project that Eric Hovind was involved in, Genesis Paradise Lost, and also they mention like, like a creationist manga series, which is really interesting. We might have to take a look at that for ourselves. Eric Hoven's character leaves while on the phone with his separated wife, telling her that he's got their son some cool gifts that he's definitely gonna love because there's dinosaurs in them, because that's how they get you. They worm their way in with the dinosaurs, because dinosaurs are, of course, very cool. Then he drives off in his Camaro after agreeing that he will now go to the Ark Encounter and watch the Ark Encounter that night. No doubt, a sequel is in the works. Then the credits roll and we see Eric Hoven's gorgeous face, his Captain America-esque face, yet again. Patrick would love for you to experience restoration with God. That's what the message of the museum is all about. No, it's not. <laughs> I've been there. There's one exhibit that covers Jesus Christ and the things that he did. And then there's like a little bit more in the historicity of the Bible section. The rest is all young earth creationism. It, it's very weird. I'm really not sure why in the first place creationists glommed on to this idea that it's very, very important that we take creationism, you know, 6,000 years ago and in six days and from dust. So literally, it, it's almost like it's less of a creationism good and more of an evolution bad thing. I, I tend to take the, the kind of pet theory that really what this is about is not wanting to be the same as all other life on Earth. People want to feel special. And if you're just another, you know, evolved animal, then you can't be special. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe that's not it. Maybe it's more important to them than that. But I think that it would be unfair to say that the Creation Museum is about Jesus more than anything else. He certainly doesn't dominate the museum's exhibits. Eric Hovind waxes poetic for a little bit about the importance of accepting salvation, becoming a Christian, things like that. That's his prerogative, like, whatever. Eric shields for his own website, and then we get an endorsement that this is happening. The, the Ark Encounter, the Night at the Ark Encounter, which is not as fun of a title as night at the Creation Museum. It makes sense why they did this one first. They had to really prime the, prime the viewers. All in all, night at the Creation Museum is cringy. It's not very fun. It's not as fun as I thought it would be. There are a couple of things that are enjoyable in it. I liked the dinosaur chase scene. I liked the joke where Eric Hovind is in space. Um, the bear thing was unsettling. I didn't like that very much. Um, but it was kind of boring. I mean, the, you, you guys should have seen what was shown on Twitter, right? Like, the, the, the trailer of this that was shown on Twitter was very much, this thing has a budget, and then it turns out it just doesn't, so they can't actually do any of the moving animatronics. And it really just kind of felt like, uh, hey, come to the Creation Museum, and you can hear more of people reading plaques <laughs> at you. <laughs> Which, I don't know, like, if I was a kid, I wouldn't have been won over by this. If this was fun for you and you want to see me cover Night at the Ark Encounter, let me know in the comments. Again, these are both just kind of like lamer versions of my Creation Museum Ark Encounter video. They're not lamer, they're, they're kind of funny. These are like enjoyable, it's kind of silly, right? But I mean, you know, it, it's hard to be as robust when it's like we just covered this material. So let me know if that sounds like something that you would find enjoyable. And so, my gentle, of course, very modern apes, do take care of yourselves. Oh, 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 oh.